It's all right. We good. Yeah. Yeah. Excellent. See you first. Great. All right. Uh, good morning to Jason and Christina. And about midnight for David. So I don't know. Should I say good night or good evening? Uh, but Jason, thank you so much for uh, for David. Uh, Jason, J David is from Australia, and Jason is from the US, and so is Christina. So, um, guys, uh, good morning and good evening to all of you. Uh, I'm your host, uh, Amit Kaushal. I am from a company called Inalito. Uh, we are an AI ML company. Uh, we have a Shopify app, Big Commerce, WooCommerce, Magento app, and we help. Uh, online stores in email marketing, personalized email marketing, the way Klaviyo does, we do it better than them. And uh, we also are into personalizing your websites. If, if people are coming on a website, your website will be personalized for each and every individual that comes on a website automatically. That's about me. Let me introduce now our first speaker, Jason Bolt. I'm introducing Jason because Jason was the first guy to come on come on the webinar about 10 minutes before it started. So Jason, thank you so much for coming over. Jason is from uh, is from Front of the US class. And uh, yes. <laughs> yeah, well, Jason in the US and the founder of a company called uh, Revent Optics. So Jason is in the business of uh, specs and glasses and uh, uh, he was his company revent was the fastest growing company in 2014 and 2016 uh, he is basically providing vision to people people who lack vision he's the one who helped them have a vision uh, he also won several awards in the entrepreneurial space and um, he is trying to revolutionize the us eyewear market and um, he's trying to provide uh, premium and affordable lenses that are better for people and planet. Welcome, Jason. Thank you so much for coming over. Looking forward to hear your views. Yeah, thank you for the uh, very kind introduction there. It's good to be here. I'm excited to yep. speak with the panel. Yep, thank you. Thank you very much, Jason. Uh, our next speaker is David. He's from Australia. He's an extremely energetic and always high on energy. He, he's the CEO of a company called Flash FOMO. Uh, about a decade old in this market. Uh, he spent about 10 years in leadership roles in Melbourne and in Singapore. And um, he is doing some fabulous work in the marketing space. And um, we welcome David Nichols today. We will talk to you more about your business and what you do. Thank you so much, David. Thanks, Amit. Thank you. Uh, Christina. Uh, Again, an extremely interesting uh, person is the founder of a company called Scopio, largest library of authentic photos powered by artificial intelligence. Excellent. So she has a lot of awards to her name, such as Forbes 30 Under 30, a Tech Boss winner, 500 Startups Batch, to name a few. Before starting her own venture, she has also worked as a pro program officer and as an investment analyst. Uh, she has been a part of Tribeca Film Festival and possess great sense of visual storytelling and creativity. Uh, it will be fun to know your experience, uh, Christina. Thank you so much for coming over this morning. Thank you. Excited to talk about right. this. Yes. So uh, let me ask my first question to, to Jason. Jason, um, what's your why? Why are you doing what you're doing? A lot of people know how to do what they do. A lot of people know what they are doing. A lot of people know how they're doing it, but they don't know why they are doing it. So do you know your why? Uh, yeah, I do. I, I think my why over time has has shifted. First, it was I needed to pay tuition money for college, I needed to find a way to, to make money. And so um, I knew, you know, online and eBay and uh, found this product and was like, this this is a way I can make money. Uh, that's evolved over time. Uh, and my why has really uh, come to be like, I really derive energy from um, creating things, building a group to create something that didn't exist before. Uh, and that's, that's something that um, really continues to drive me as we grow the company and the business. Um, and uh, so anything from products to new systems, now we're using uh, technology to really democratize access to better vision, uh, which wasn't possible before the internet. And then a lot of the tools that are coming online for uh, eye care. So my why uh, has evolved, I'd say over the years, but um, I think, you know, really over the past five years, 
I found that I just love leading this company uh, and building a team that that I want to build the future of the eyewear industry with. So that's uh, that's currently where I'm at. May evolve, but uh, uh, right now I'm just uh, enjoying the ride. Excellent. So Jason, you you spoke about developing products, but mm-hmm. why an eyewear product? What problem are you trying to solve which was not solved previously? Yeah, yeah, it's really two part. So the first the first one is that. Uh, there was really a gap in the market that I found where, you know, people that would buy eyewear would typically throw out their eyewear if, if a lens was scratched or their prescription expired. So there's just a lot of waste there, right? They didn't know that you can easily replace lenses in any pair of eyewear. Um, so that was really That's the me, first number component. one person. Dailies. What was that? That's me, number Sorry. one. I use dailies. Yeah, yeah. So there's this- <laughs> And again, it's sort of a culture of like planned obsolescence within uh, the eyewear space in particular, where you're saying like, we want you to buy the 2.0 version, you need to get new frames, because again, your lenses are scratched. And it's just a ton of waste, like our industry, you know, generates 1000s of tons of plastic waste every year. And that doesn't account for all the eyewear and contacts that are thrown out every day. Um, So we're really working to solve that problem. Uh, And then the other part is just, again, democratizing access to better vision. About 60% of uh, humans that need corrective vision for their everyday life don't have access to it because they're either in an area that doesn't have an eye care provider uh, or they can't afford the, uh, the um, corrective vision that they need. So, again, a huge opportunity to help you know, improve lives for people. Uh, and then the other component is uh, just there's a huge opportunity within the eyewear space. There are two major players, Luxottica and, and Safalo, that own most of the market, uh, from products to insurers to all the major brands you've heard of. They're all owned by the same companies. So uh, when you have a situation like that, you you get uh, you know lack of uh, options, and and some of the the pricing is very high. I'll put it that way that it doesn't need to be so really democratizing access to better vision for people around the globe. Uh, we started in the US, but we have global plans uh, and then just reduction of waste in our in our industry. So those are lifelong uh, missions there. It's there's a, there's a lot of work to do. Excellent, uh, Jason, uh, you're doing a fabulous work in this space. Uh, we will talk to you more in the session. Thank you so much for the initial introduction. That's good, thanks. Yep. Mm-hmm. Christina, uh, from being an investment analyst and uh, have won so many awards, why did you decide to come in the uh, space of uh, having these authentic pictures and, and helping these artists come online? So what's your why? So I actually have been studying the and all the experiences that I've had were in studying social movements online. I was the first person to start writing about the power of Facebook groups. And so I went to Columbia for grad school to kind of figure out what I wanted to do in this space. And when I was there, I remember seeing images on the news and those are coming from Twitter, from Black Lives Matter, the Arab Spring, the Venezuela protests. And I said, these images don't belong on Twitter and getting lost. They belong in newspapers, they belong in museums, they belong in history books. And I wanted to make it my mission to get these images and save them. So, I knew that if people saw these images and really we had access to this outside of social media, that we could change the way that we saw the world, that the world would become closer, that stereotypes would change. And looking around me, seeing everybody taking these images, I said, this is only gonna get more exciting as an opportunity, but more of a problem because everything is just stuck on Twitter, stuck on Instagram, and it's not making its way across there. At the same time, artists don't get paid uh, today and they're all struggling. A lot of them get in trouble in the countries they live in for even being an artist. So I wanted to make a way to get them paid, uh, given that everybody wanted to use this content. So that was where the passion of Scopio came from and where all the, I guess, awards or um, co- like achievements really came from this central idea, which is something that I really wanted to impact and I thought was as big as my dreams were and something that I could work on for a long time. So that was always since I was a little girl, I wanted the biggest problem I could solve, something really big that I could change in the world. So when I had found that, I went after that. And um, that was about seven years ago. Fabulous, Uh, great, Christina. Thank you so much for setting the context right. 
David, over to you. Tell us a little bit about about your business and what you do, and uh, what's your what's your calling. Sure. Well, firstly, I'm clearly in some pretty good company here, so I'm a little bit embarrassed. But um, <laughs> uh, yeah. So the company um, that I founded, it's called Flash FOMO. We're a social commerce company. Uh, we help um, basically creators, uh, music artists, gamers create and sell their own branded merchandise. Um, we connect to about 90 manufacturers globally that kind of plug into our backend system. Everything that we do is all made to order um, products. And then we work with influencers to basically build their e-commerce play, whether that's their own website, whether it fits into our marketplace or whether we integrate um, those products onto basically their merch shelf on YouTube. Um, so I guess, you know, my calling, how I got into this, um, I was pretty young, I guess, when I moved to Singapore um, and became the general manager of a, a publicly listed social video company when I was there. Um, we we're also a multi-channel network, so we managed thousands of, of uh, creators. And basically what I started to see was this evolution of, um, particularly in these developing markets, particularly around Asia, um, where we had a lot of creators, we're getting a, you know, billions of minutes worth of watch time on the videos per, um, per month, but only like the top 1% were kind of being rewarded in terms of creating um, you know, a sustainable business or a new source of revenue. Um, so I guess, you know, the purpose and, and what we want to build was basically a new source of revenue for creators uh, and primarily in, in developing markets uh, and utilizing some technologies that, that, you know, previously existed in either Eastern markets or Western markets, and then trying to bridge them for both um, markets to basically make it a, uh, you know, a globally accessible for, for their fans, which are online and not always um, coming from one small uh, niche area. Um, Hopefully that gives you a bit of an explanation of what we do and maybe we can delve further into it later. Absolutely. So David, uh, can you also talk a little bit about competition? How do you, how do you uh, place yourself in view of the competition? What advice would you give to people who are struggling because competition, because of competition? Um, yeah, pretty good question. I think we um, we're interested in what they're doing. Um, I guess I probably would uh, say that you know, for our in, in our industry, that you know, um, perception can obviously can sometimes be seen as reality, uh, and don't get wound up into the perception too much. Um, so if you're seeing a competitor that's putting out a really, you know, uh, alluring post, or they're raising lots of money in the billions of dollars or whatever whatever it might be, uh, it's really just controlling what you can control. Um, so that's what we focus on. Is great. Um, that's fantastic. They're doing well. Uh, it's great to grow the industry, um, but really, are they doing as well as uh, the perception is saying? So uh, for me, it's about then using that as a, a motivator and, uh, and also, you know, being able to control what we can control. Uh, and then just trying to really, like probably to Christina's point, is just to solve the problems better. Um, so solve them in more cost-effective ways, solve them in better ways for, that the consumers can be impacted. So, um, yeah. That's probably my advice or um, our learnings from uh, our experiences. Great, David. Thank you so much for that. Uh, Christina, how do you how do you compete with the free images available on Google and all other places? How do you how do you compete with that? How do you look at those things? Yeah. So I same with David. I don't really look at other businesses. I look at my customers and. The artists on my platform and how I can bring them value. So we're again, we're similar where we're focused on a global artist base. We have 150 countries of people that submit their images to us. They're between the ages of 19 and 25. They're really excited. Again, they're that 99% that have been left out. So I we listen a lot to them. First, we started doing a lot of content for them. So we have a YouTube channel, a podcast called The Authentic Photographer. Um, and then we moved into webinars and now we talk with dozens uh, of customers or photographers daily. So we always listen to what they want and we move from there. And I feel like that's the, the most sane way and best way to really focus in is because also the younger generation and this global generation is completely different than than what you would think or what we've been exposed to. So there's so much learning that has to happen and like you gotta kind of 
take a slice of humble pie for breakfast and re-listen to that every single day so that you know that you're re that you're building the best product that you can and you're serving uh, your audience in a new and exciting way. Because people buy excitement, they buy hype, they buy something new and interesting. They want to know who's behind it as well. So we really use the artists. That, they're so interesting. So we use them as the as the front and center of the business. And I think that's what uh, people want to come to Scopio for is this access and this uniqueness. Fabulous. Uh, thank you so much, Christine. That's a great input. Um, over to you, Jason. Jason, mm -hmm. what are the core values that drive you and your business? Yeah, we have uh, five core values. <laughs> so that's really at the center of a, a lot of what we do. Um, but I'd say the main one internally and externally is just, and, and similar to what David and Christina are saying, like how are we building trust and staying close to our customers? Uh, and how are we building trust internally? There's a, a, a lot of work we do to kind of facilitate building trust. It's been harder during COVID because we're all uh, for the most part remote. So it's harder to connect Virtually, we had a lot of like in-person events to try and foster those relationships uh, prior to COVID, but um, those values have carried through into this virtual world, this virtual reality, and I think that's that's what's really carried us. So, um, you know, we cultivate community is another one. How are we doing that um, as a team and, and with our, our customers and our community here locally? I think that's been really important this year. Uh, and then we focus on continual improvement. So how are we building what's next? How do we have an eye towards the future? Um, whether it's, you know, again, sustainability, growing the business, um, new and exciting ways to stay close to our customers and what's, what's trending, what's exciting. Uh, that's harder to do when you're making uh, an accessory for an accessory replacement lenses. <laughs> so we try and uh, really come up with content that's engaging uh, and come at like, engaging with our community in different ways. But those core values um, are, have always been important, but have been uh, even more important over the last uh, you know, year and a half uh, as we try and navigate what it means to be distributed uh, and then all the other uh, you know, things that popped up last year that, that we had to work through as an organization. So um, yeah, those are, I guess, just a, a couple of our core values and how we've, how we've carried them through this year. Fabulous. Uh, yeah, so, yes, so, so the importance of core values cannot be undermined. I think it's very important to first of all know them and of course carry forward. Your team must also believe in you and believe in those core values and only then you progress. Uh, thank you for bringing the point home, uh, Jason. Uh, David, when you hire people, what do you look for? Um, or, and to expand the question a bit more, I, for example, uh, Jeff Bezos and uh, Henry Ford said you should have the courage to hire people who are smarter than you. Uh, what do you say about that? Yeah, absolutely. So, um, uh, yes, yeah, so it depends on which stage you're kind of hiring for. Um, so I guess like characteristics or values we look for is probably, you know, someone with an at the early stage would be like entre entrepreneurial spirit. Um, someone's a bit of a futurist as well. So someone that can kind of come on that visionary journey with us. Um, but I think there's, you know, there's probably four elements that you'd look at um, and they, you know, probably each employee would fit into one of these categories, whether they're, you know, technical, whether they're doing a technical job for us, um, whether they're a manager, a leader, or whether, you know, further beyond that into more of the entrepreneurial strategy type. So depending on the stage of um, when we start to bring people on, um, yeah, values are important to start with. And then I think it starts to get down to kind of what technical needs they meet and then whether what phase of the business we're in, whether we're, you know, enabling growth or we're starting to drive growth. So, um, yeah, we're probably in that period now where we're just trying to get in a lot of technical people um, to fulfill specific tasks. Um, but, yeah, we've gone through all stages over the last two years. Since you have been, David, helping a lot of e-commerce merchants, a lot of e-commerce businesses, my, my question, second question to you would be, what tips would you give to online stores, business, online businesses in 2021 uh, about, about making a growth? About driving growth? Yeah. Um, yeah, good question. Um, I can only really speak specific to us. Like, um, 
for us, it's, you know, making good partnerships, um, you know, and with, you know, respectable partners, uh, like we partnered with YouTube in late, late last year. Uh, and to give you some perspective, you know, prior to partnering with them, uh, we had to kind of prove, uh, I guess, you know, social, we had to give social proof to our customers, to uh, potential clients, you know, that we were trustworthy, that we were uh, worth giving a go. Um, and, you know, to put it into perspective, in our, in our first year, we had 25 um, clients use us. Uh, and in the last 90 days, since we signed our partnership with YouTube, we've had 7,000 clients come to us. So we've seen kind of insane growth in the last 90 days. But um, I think the importance of uh, partnerships and the right partners that can try and enable that growth, um, that's what I would focus on um, for, you know, anyone in, you know, going through a similar transition to us. Fabulous. So, uh, David is focusing a lot of uh, lot of attention on right partnerships because that will give you a hockey stick growth, uh, not linear growth. Uh, so that's the key success, uh, key for success, David's success. Thank you so much, David, for sharing that uh, uh, tip. Uh, Christina, uh, what's do you believe in goals? If yes, what goals do you set for yourself and for your organization, and how do you ensure you meet your goals? Yeah, um, of course, goals are very important. If you can't, what is it? If you can't say it, then it's not going to happen. So um, you, it's, but it is challenging to get your whole team to really understand a few goals. I think once you bombard with too many goals, nothing gets achieved. Uh, so our main two goals on one side is image growth. So our goal is to be at 5 million images by the end of the year. We're at uh, 500,000 now almost. And, uh, that's a big, so that means a lot of things. It means gets, get more artists, the current artists that we have to contribute more content to us. And then on the other hand, the other, the goals are just like David said, partnerships are actually something that entrepreneurs don't think about a lot, but actually drive a lot of growth. So we have partners as well that we host our images in their apps and uh, that drives us to hundreds of millions of users. While we focus on those partnerships, the idea is that you want people to come directly to you. So we have also um, our e-commerce number. We're the largest store on Shopify for images. We have 25,000 businesses that use us on Shopify for, for images. They download and they subscribe through Scopio there. It's like about $29 a month. Um, so while we're building these the e-commerce site, which is much more difficult of a thing to do, you have these partner channels that are driving your mass adoption. So I think it's hard to say, okay, you know, go out and get a million more customers on your store. When in reality, it's there's no way these people that it's not an achievable goal for your 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 uh, team. So then they'll feel defeated. So uh, sometimes when the goal is not clear, there it's a little more difficult. But that's why you need to have these balancing uh, objectives like, okay, well, if you get a YouTube partner, 7,000 more customers, then that counts as our 7,000 more users on our store. So it's one partnership, 7,000 users versus your team going and trying to get 7,000 customers, which we know is an unachievable objective at this stage. So I think that's where you have to be clear with the goals, but it's really hard to get your team to understand the weight of these different um, opportunities. And I think that's the challenge of a leader. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So yeah, so nicely put Christina. Of course, Christina has uh, made it very clear that uh, the importance of goals, having smart goals, uh, which are smart basically means uh, a specific, measurable, time-bound, uh, realistic uh, goals. Uh, well, I'm actually a very unrealistic person. So we do a lot <laughs> of experiments. Like I, I wake up in the morning with 70 ideas and I also have my team run those. So while you have your goals, I don't want to deceive the audience here because I'm not like that. I'm actually all over the place. While you're setting your goals, the idea how to get to the goal is the crazy stuff that you do. So you do a crazy campaign, you build out really funky like plans to get to that goal. So it's not like send 10 emails, get 10 customers. It's like do all sorts of different things that you're trying. So uh, you want to be structured, but all, entrepreneurs are all over the place, I think. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. <laughs> I, I empathize with you, Christina. We, we, <laughs> the, way, the way that we structure it is that- Not a good like, false well, information. 
<laughs> we'll have like the structured like OKRs and whatever, you know, the, the right structures. But then yeah. we have bags, the big, hairy, audacious goals. And the big, hairy, audacious goals are those, I want $100 million in revenue this year that at least yeah. you know, you're driving towards those those bigger ideas. So uh, yeah, it's absolutely. And I, I can understand like that's, we have very similar um, mindsets in, in how we view the goals. Yes, absolutely. So B hack uh, is big, hairy, audacious goal. This was being set by you know, Boeing in 1915s when they were talking about commercial flight. So Boeing was only supplying, uh, was only in the aircrafts for, for, for Air Force in the US and they started talking about commercial flights uh, having a 20 year old 20 year goal so that was BHAG and uh, that this con concept came from Boeing but yes a lot of organizations today have BHAG have big hairy audacious goals and uh, they uh, they are they are really running running for it as well uh, and experiment sprints too where they're running sprints on experiments so you should have multiple experiments running every mm -hmm. day for different things so that you can try to reach that mass like adoption level Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, Jason, uh, what platforms do you use to sell? And last 18 months or so, what have been your biggest challenges? So the platforms we use to sell, uh, we're a Shopify store. So 80, 85% of our business is direct through our Shopify website, uh, revenoptics.com. Uh, and then we also sell through Amazon. Um, but our, our, really our focus is to uh, drive as many uh, customers to our website as possible. We find that's where we can provide a better experience. Uh, we can experiment more. Um, we're constantly running uh, tests on shopping flow and ads and um, copy and content uh, just to optimize as, you know, we see what, what customers react to and in, in different cohorts. So um that, that provides a lot of focus, which is great. When we set goals, we can set goals mainly for our website. And we, we grow through performance marketing at this point. Um, a lot of just direct, like how do we optimize uh, our funnels? And so uh, that's what a more, majority of my marketing uh, team, team works on. Um, and your second question, can you remind me again what the two-part second question was? What was the second what question? What challenges did you face in the last... Oh, what challenges yeah. did you face in the last 18 months and how do you resolve them? Yeah. So I think, you know, again, with, with COVID, we, we do most of our manufacturing here, um, but we rely on an international supply chain uh, and most of our um, products, uh, just the raw materials come from Asia. So right when COVID hit, that was right around Chinese New Year um, and our, our lead times doubled um, for most of our factories in Asia. And that was in the middle of switching over our entire product catalog to a higher quality material. So we had leaned out all of our inventory uh, in 20 warehouses around the world. And so uh, March, April, we got hit real hard um, because we started selling out a product before the new material came in and there was nothing we could do about it. You know, my typical nature is like, we got to fix this. You know, how do we put out this fire? Can we fly over to Asia? Not possible. Um, so it was really an exercise in like staying level-headed myself and then sort of helping my team work through that process uh, by working in other areas. So, you know, the core business, while we're selling out of some of our best-selling products, that's really deflating. But we really turned that into an opportunity to focus in other areas that we could bolster, knowing that, you know, this is really going to drive more uh, direct-to-consumer online business as people started working from home and, and not going into retail anymore. So. I'd say that was our biggest challenge up front. Um, and now a lot of it is just uh, dealing with growth and, and maintaining and managing culture while we're hiring people. Uh, and 20% of my team now I, I haven't met in person. I've only met through a screen. So again, trying to foster those connections, make sure people feel like connected to each other and the company and what we're building here uh, is a challenge. I think we've done, done okay at that, um, but um, again, I'm a big like in-person uh, connect uh, community type. So uh, I'm looking forward to when we can do that again. Um, but I would say those two things have been uh, my main focus uh, as far as uh, challenges to overcome over the last 18 months. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Thank you so much, Jason, for that. Mm -hmm. uh, David, uh, so 
people who come to you for with their business uh how do you ensure that they do a different job and better job for them every time and how do you keep the motivation up and running with your team how do you make sure that your team is aligned to your vision is always committed to giving their best is always obsessive about adding value to what they are doing how do you ensure all of that um yeah a pretty good question that's it's difficult particularly right now because of um you know not working in a centralized uh, area together um but i think what the first part of your question was what are we doing was that in reference to our customers or yes yeah and what what are we doing to add value to our customers yeah so let me let me just take a different example different different ways of explaining this basically there are there are customers who come and go then yep. there are clients who stay longer with you and then sure. there are fans who love you so okay. how do you ensure your your customers become your fans i mean this journey from customer to client to a fan how do you ensure you make your customer into a fan okay cool i understand that now um so we we kind of use so the what we do is we build brands around influencers so the influencers already have big strong uh fan bases around them and what they want is it the influencers to put into like a human perspective um and the ones that we're dealing with are living in apartments with their parents uh and they might be doing you know running so many different parts of their business uh they might be content creators so they're constantly filming themselves um they need to edit so they need to be competent around editing uh they need to then grow their audiences they need to uh basically communicate with their audiences whether it's positive or negative um and then if they want to get into new areas of monetization methods then uh and let's say it's their own brand or their own product then they start dealing with manufacturers they start dealing with logistics they start dealing with uh e-commerce um uh platforms and these types of things so what we try and do is solve the problem for the person that has all the fans so by what we do is we you know make sure that's uh, you know solving all those problems around the logistics the manufacturing the uh design all these types of things uh if we can kind of help them connect those pieces better uh we basically skip a few steps and go straight from solving a problem to them uh already having the fans that are being driven to our site so when that influencer um says great here's my a uh, new branded product that i've created at sunglasses that's made to order uh it's in my own packaging i'm really proud of it we've done 99.9% of the work they're claiming the 100% of the work which we're happy for them to do um and the fans are um you know the millions of fans are then gravitating to that which then drives our audience so we're basically able to drive what we would call a zero dollar customer acquisition cost because the fans turn into the customers for free brought to us by the influencer of which we take a percentage of that um by taking i guess the risk at the at the start for for investing our time and our resource into helping them mhm mm interesting that's interesting strategy david thank you so much for for sharing it with us um uh, christina what's your obsession in your business what are you most obsessed about in your business making my artists money mm -hmm. so how do, you, how do you ensure that your artists make money so when people buy a subscription or they hire an artist they get paid and because my artists are in 150 countries sometimes it's it could be half their salary for the month um or it could be buying them their first camera or investing in their creative side hustle so it could really change their life especially when we're talking about people in uh, you know anything from brazil to japan to india to to china and they're, we're getting they're getting paid so um so i think what i need to do and what the difficulty i mean not the difficulty but you have to bring customers for that demand so they're signed up they're super excited we also give them perks and discounts so they get discounts to places like adobe and canva and it's really expensive to be an artist you need all these tools uh to use to to get better to improve yourself so we also decided that okay we're not just going to try to make the money we'll try to save the money as well and then connect them with these really big businesses that are looking for talent in these different spaces so it's a lot of matchmaking um but it's also 
allow having these businesses know about this uh, product and then having these people every month getting paid on the platform more and more and more. So, mm -hmm. and there's good comparables too. Like there's always good things to look at. Like there's an audio company called Splice. They did 40 million in payouts to artists. You know, something like Shutterstock has done 1 billion in payouts to photographers. So you're talking about taking a big part of that money back into the world. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So yes. So if you if you to, as Christina has like brought the hammered the case home, uh, when you start thinking about adding value and making money for somebody else, and and start and start working on working on somebody else's success, that's when you get successful. That's exactly what Warren Buffett also said that he he's making billions of dollars for others, and then he's making some billions for him himself as well. So the obsession is perfect to have. Try to work for what what Christina is saying is, is work for somebody else's success. Work for success of your partners, of your people, of your team, and then success comes to you automatically. Thank you for bringing them bringing the concept home, uh, Christina. Jason, you have been doing your business uh, for a while now, uh, out about a decade or so. Am I right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Do you believe in the concept of putting the business in autopilot? And you make your money without you getting up from your bed. In other words, your business running without you. Do you believe oh. in that concept? Uh, Can your business no. run without you? <laughs> no, I, I think it's possible. You don't want it I, know to? There are I know there are business models that that allow you know for that to happen for a, I would say a short shorter period of time than than what I'm interested in building. Um, you know, it all depends on your goals. If you want to set up like a drop ship, whatever, I want to sleep, work an hour a day and, you know, make some money. I'm sure that's possible. I, I have friends that do that. Um, but for me personally, um, I would not want to be involved at all with my business if that were the case, at least at this point in life. Like I just, um, I think to your point, like working for your customer, for your people, to build livelihoods, to change the world. Christina touched on that a lot in, in sort of her personal mission there with artists. That's like, that's the driving force. I think if it were pure money, uh, you know, you can do that. You know, there's a lot of different opportunities to make money, but there are very few opportunities to, I think, meaningfully uh, invest in people's lives and and do something meaningful. So now that I feel so like I hit it, let, let me clarify that, Jason. Yeah, yeah. yeah let, let me clarify that. Maybe because I misunderstood you know the question. All people, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because all yeah. these people, let's say, let's talk about all these people. Let's say, but all the billionaires, yeah. all, all the Bill Gates and Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk. Yeah, yeah. Or, or everybody, or all the entrepreneurs, or serial entrepreneurs who have been starting a business, putting it in autopilot mode, going to the next one, putting it in autopilot, going to the next one, and yeah. you don't, of okay. course, lose. You, you, of course, keep making impact on people's life, but in different way, in a different business. And hence, Got it's it. very important yeah. to put your first business in autopilot, go to the next one, and all of that. So, do you do you advocate that philosophy? Do you endorse that philosophy? And my answer is the same. I think like if you've built a business model that's self-sustaining and you don't feel like there's a lot more you can do from an entre entrepreneurial standpoint to build that, then absolutely. Like if that's what you want to do, build multiple businesses, become that serial entrepreneur. Um, I think that's impressive. Uh, what I've chosen to do with Revan is actually maintain that entrepreneurial st spirit in a very large market. So, you know, even though we may bring a brand new material or product to market, that we're really proud of. There's a hundred other things we could do uh, with products, with technology, with services. So really within Revent and that business framework, for me, there's, there's a never ending uh, opportunity to be entrepreneurial. But if I did get to that point where I'm like, this is the perfect business model in my industry or, or, or category, and I'm, I don't feel like I can contribute my skill set anymore in this this industry, then yeah, I'd start up another business and and uh, and try something new. Mm -hmm. Interesting. So, uh, Jason, uh, uh, you are using Shopify. So, uh, what Shopify tools do you use? Apps do you use to become more efficient? Uh, let's see. Yeah, we we just replatformed to Shopify in March. Um, and we're using, uh, let's see, we have use Hotjar. I don't know if you've heard of that, but it's a heat mapping tool to see like how customers are interacting with our website. 
Um, that I would say has been one of our most valuable tools to show us what content they find most engaging. Uh, we, we all had our theories, but once we installed and, and started monitoring Hotjar, it, it kind of blew those theories out of the water in some ways. So that most of the tools we use are, are in place to help us get, get insight from how customers interact with our site and our products. Um, for some other ones that we're using currently. Um, we just, uh, there's one called, man, I have to look it up, but it's basically another insight product that pulls all of our customer data in and shows like visualizes, uh, and you can click in different areas, you know, what their top uh, hobbies are, movies, uh, just everything across the board you would wanna know about different cohorts. Uh, and I'll look at it really, really quickly after I um, sort of stop talking here, but that one's a brand new one we implemented and that's actually shaping a lot of how we're creating content and products. So we're, we're big on personalization. Um, how do we make sure that any customer coming to our site finds what they need quickly and finds the content compelling? Uh, if they want to go really deep into like optical technology and the physics behind it, we want to be able to provide that. Uh, if they just want lenses because, you know, they have a scratch, we want to provide that as well. So uh, a lot of our tools are centered around uh, how we enable personalization uh, and optimize a site and product for customers. Excellent. Wonderful, Jason. Thank you so much. Um, David, coming to you, so you're using a lot of influencers and other marketing techniques for your clients. Uh, can you give us three tips online businesses can use to, to basically have exceptional marketing? Three marketing tips that online businesses can use in 2021? Okay, give me the good ones. Um, <laughs> three big tips. Um, yeah, I think it's, yeah, for, well, I can only speak to our business because I'm so focused on it, but um, it's, yeah, for us, we just try and find people that have, you know, good voices in niche communities. Uh, and if they can be our supporters, then they can bring supporters or fans to us. Um, so I guess that's our, our first focus. Um, another marketing tip, I don't know, like there's, <laughs> that, that's really my only focus, to be honest, is uh, trying to get a $0 customer acquisition cost and I'm cheap, I'm Australian. So um, yeah, we don't really try and pay for our customers to on board with us, which was try and do it through partnerships or other means. Uh, unfortunately, I can't give you three, I can only give you one. <laughs> no problem. Let me ask you a more deep question then. I mean, you, you use a lot of influencers uh, for marketing. How do you influence the influencers to come and market for somebody? What, yeah, what sure. kind of, so, how, do you, how do you bring them on board? Sure. So first of all, they're marketing their own brand uh, and it's in their nature to be able to promote themselves. So um, it's quite easy when you are posi positioning it like that. I worked really closely with influence over the last, oh, since 2014, um, but working with influences in China, Japan, USA, Southeast Asia, Australia, you know, global influences. And we were paying them anywhere from say $10,000 to half a million dollars per campaigns. And so it was quite easy to kind of get influences on, uh, on the phone to, you know, influence or celebrities. Uh, they start to bridge that gap when they uh, start to command the, the bigger dollars. But it's easy to kind of get them uh, to, to represent a brand when you're throwing huge amounts of money at them. Um, but I think when, you know, their real interest point is when um, I guess it's uncapped, their opportunity is uncapped. And that's the way that we sell it into them is, well, you could go and do a campaign for, you know, a particular brand for $10,000, or you could sell it, you know, obviously they're, they're, that brand is valuing you, giving a value on, on your audience. Um, and I think my way of positioning that right now, my uh, current position is saying, well, I think you're undervalued as an influencer. I think your, your audiences are being undervalued by brands and you should value them more by uh, giving them more value, give them what they want, which is something more of that personal touch, that personal brand that they can resonate with and own a piece of you. Um, so that's how we kind of sell it into them is, um, you know, more of a, uh, appealing to their, um, you know, appealing to them building out their brand. Uh, more so than uh, representing someone else's brand. Uh, and in turn, that becomes the most authentic version of themselves because they're building something that they want to build. Mm -hmm. Excellent. So that's what, what you are saying, David, I think perfectly well. So you also have to think about influencers or celebrities, but what would they want to associate themselves with? 
what will help them achieve their goals and if they are able to resonate with the idea then they will of course do it for you my my follow up question is for for you is when you are paying let's say half a million dollar whatever whatever amount to these celebrities and influencers how do you measure the whatever you paid to them what's the roi on that how do you measure the roi when you are using these influencers yeah so it's pretty difficult and i could um it, it's difficult so you like some of the um the difference is that you know the half a million would be spent on like a k-pop star and that k-pop star has built up their brand to such a strong level um that they would get instant brand recognition so for the like i guess what we used to and this is going to my previous businesses because that's when we used to pay influencers we don't pay influence anymore um but yeah in, in previous experiences you know with my former businesses uh very hard to kind of measure that effectiveness um we could go and create the tvc we could create the i guess the viral views but um it was really hard to then track that end conversion uh particularly when we were selling products that were uh you know about $200 skincare products that didn't have an e-commerce uh element to it uh and were predominantly purchased uh in you know large retail outlets or in duty free areas um so i think it becomes difficult um when you're working it with um uh you know utilizing those big k-pop stars or you know um stars in you know big drama actresses in china or victoria secret models very hard to kind of get that roi a lot easier when you've got a social first influencer that is selling an e-commerce brand that has proper you know tracking and tagging around it um so yeah there's complete you know it can be done to some extent but i'd say it's still a really big area that could um uh could be done a lot better mhm mm yes absolutely so of course you can you're measuring the marketing and measuring your marketing spend is is something that's always been challenging but let me let me come to christina christina uh, are you a big fan of ads do you do ads on google facebook instagram um i have a mixed feelings i do ads sometimes but our primary growth channel is through our content so we decided that again you ask me what i think about i think about how i'm going to make my artists more money so the more i'm spending to mark zuckerberg or to the google platform the less i'm paying my artists so we decided actually to put them forward and i was really bootstrapped i just started interviewing them on ig on ig live and on zoom started to record them put them up on podcasts put them up on our youtube channel we started to distribute it through linkedin um and really switch off of advertising so that i could not only help them but then also give them content so that they can help promote themselves so a lot of them will take the, that video or that podcast and they'll go get business with that and so um so we decided to invest in the content team which is video production um and we have editors and writing and uh basically adopted what what i think like is a great model which is the gary v model um the gary vaynerchuk model so i follow his his like work a lot on just produce a lot of content and get that out there so we've switched i think from ads so it depends what you think about but ultimately if you want to boost and reach new audiences um it is a good strategy but you really need to have like a dedicated uh i guess dedicated approach to that and right now i just don't feel like it's there so it's difficult when you also like don't really agree much with the platforms you're working with so there's so much controversy around facebook so you're you're going to give half of your revenue to facebook when you don't really like are agreeing with their practices so it makes things more difficult so i think influencers or organic content is much more comfortable for for a lot of entrepreneurs today um and then again partnerships or different tricks like that mm -hmm. excellent so christina in in your business where do you spend most of your time looking after what I manage my team most of the time. So I have I spend a lot of time training them, trying to really we're a mission-driven organization, so I really focus on 
everybody knowing exactly what the mission is, being able to communicate that with anybody that they're speaking with, and then uh, having them start thinking, again, that entrepreneurial mindset that David was saying, that I need everybody to think like an entrepreneur. Whenever we get an opportunity, we need to take that opportunity and we need to 10 times the traction on that. So for example, we had a Business Insider article and a Yahoo Finance article. So I, when I give that to my team, I need them to think about, okay, how do we leverage this now? Not like sending me back a congratulations for the article. So I think that's the challenge in teaching people how um, and teaching and growing the team. And ultimately like beyond paying artists, it's really rewarding to, to grow uh, your staff and really teach them and have them be strong and know that the next place that they're gonna go, they're gonna have such a bet better career and just really position their success. And especially me with having women on my team, having like a woman leader to teach them, like you have no limit, you just keep going and build yourself. I think that I didn't expect that it would be like that, but seeing that and watching how much they grow in such a short period of time is really um, exciting. So I think investing in the people that you work with and really, and so I, I would love to have a thousand employees and be able to teach them and grow them. And um, because ultimately this is your life and you're spending your every day talking with these people. So, you know, you might as well enjoy that as much as you can too. Mm -hmm. Excellent. I think you, you said it perfectly. Uh, thank you very much for, for, for telling us how important it is to, to make sure that your team is aligned to your ideas and training them and teaching them and, and listening sure to that... their ideas too. Yeah. Because mm -hmm. you can yes. get in your own way a lot and they might have better ideas that you can think about. Absolutely. Absolutely. Uh, coming to you, Jason, are you guys funded or bootstrapped? Uh, we're bootstrapped. So is that is it by design? Yet. Is it by design or by default? Uh, a little bit of both. Uh, I think, you know, early on, I wanted to maintain uh, control over the company's direction and, and move quickly. And uh, so I just tried to structure how we grew around those two uh, goals in a way. Uh, and we were able to grow pretty organically for the first five years where marketing was a very small percentage uh, of revenue just because it was a new product category. Uh, and there was a lot of demand out there for it. So uh, it's pretty, it's unique, but we've also done a good, good job of like managing our cash and making sure that, you know, we're, we're growing within sort of the bounds of what we can fund. Uh, and I think in that way, it also helps us to really hone in on and, and try and make the best decisions. We've had some money pit decisions before, but uh, for the most part, we're very, very focused on, you know, again, looking at solving customers' problems, not just doing what we think is cool. And hopefully those two things line up. Uh, there's room for creativity, of course, but like I've, I've, I think both David and Christina have mentioned, you know, the, the creative idea generating aspect of being an entrepreneur is part of why we do it. Um, but that can also run you off the rails pretty quickly. Um, so it's kind of harnessing the best ideas, working with your team and then uh, using your cash uh, as efficiently as possible. It's the way that we've, we've, operated so far. Mm -hmm. So in the future, do you plan to raise money? Uh, I think so. We're actually looking at that right now. Um, it really comes down to like how much of the opportunity can we go after um, and how quickly do we need to do it? And we're at the point now, like, again, because of sort of what COVID's driven, a lot of e-commerce growth, uh, that the opportunity that I thought we'd have in three years is now here. So working to scale our operations and our team so that we can capture that opportunity uh, means we're going to have to pull more capital in from somewhere that may be uh, bank debt uh, or it may be some sort of equity sale. But uh, we're evaluating that right now. I'm actually working to try and find a, a CFO um, that specializes in e-com to come help us uh, put some models together. Excellent. All the best, Jason. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Coming to you, David. David, you mentioned that in the last 90 days, you had a huge influx of about 7,000 customers coming to you. Uh, how are you able to manage this influx and how did it happen? Uh, yes, it's actually not 
Uh, well, yeah, they're influencers that have come to us. So in terms of the customers, then it's uh, whatever their audience size is. Um, so for us, uh, yeah, it's been, it was kind of difficult at the time. <laughs> um, we had to basically hire people and put job descriptions out pretty quickly. Um, I guess a lot of our processes are frictionless, uh, but some of our onboarding processes are probably uh, where we realized we really need to fix them. So we're in the process of fixing our onboarding um, processes. I don't think it's something that will ever be finished. I think we'll just keep getting to certain area, like we'll be happy with something, we'll think it's great, and then we'll get another influx or something else will happen and we'll want to try and deviate or pivot that, um, uh, that process. So what we actually have done is we um, have kind of, we've aligned ourselves with like a, the Talent Institute in, in, uh, in Australia. Uh, and basically, and they, they work with a lot of startups and they do hackathons. So basically we uh, have, you know, kind of organized hackathons with, um, you know, graduates or, you know, ex, you know, people that are kind of graduating or first or looking for work that are either um, engineers, marketers, uh, coders, whatever they might be, and basically getting 20, 30 people in the room and uh, crowdsourcing the ideas and help letting them help us solve our problems faster. Um, so I guess that's probably the main thing. I've always thought of how can I solve it fast and how can I bring in more ideas and more ideas cheaply? Because that's, I guess, the, the mindset of what we need to focus on rather than going out and hiring, you know, a CTO and paying them whatever they cost per year, but getting slow results from it. Um, yeah, so our first kind of um, thought was reach out to all the advisors um, within our business. We have a lot of advisors because we've taken on um, some funding. Um, so we've got um, yeah, a number of advisors in different categories that have been able to help us, different platforms. Uh, and then those advisors have basically pointed us down the track of um, doing these hackathons with people that are much smarter than us to try and solve the problems because um, a lot of these are process driven, which I'm not great at. Um, but we've been great at, I guess, onboarding uh, and, and creating enough hype to generate the interest. So, yeah, I think it's just a, an ever-evolving space that we're trying to solve daily. Mm -hmm. Excellent. Excellent, David. Thank you so much for giving us those tips. I think, yes, it's important, it's important that we don't react to situations. We think about it and then we do take a conscious call of how can we solve the problem like David did in a most uh, cost-effective manner and a, in a fast way. Uh, thank you so much, David, for sharing that. Guys, in the last round, uh, if you have any question to a fellow speaker, uh, you can shoot now. I have one for Christina, uh, I think early on, and I'm really impressed with both your businesses. It's been really great thank to hear you. how you're how you're growing and, and just, uh, I feel like we'd have a great time getting a beer together at some point. So maybe in Australia, I've always wanted to go. Uh, <laughs> yeah, <that'd be> awesome. <laughs> um, so Are you, you in mentioned... Sydney or Melbourne? Um, in Melbourne. Okay. Yeah. Um, um, you mentioned going from 500,000 to 5 million this year. Is that right? From a content standpoint, images? Yeah. Uh, you know, just, how what, what's sort of the plan to do that because like that 10x growth is really impressive and i always like wonder how different businesses scale like that in particular like you know you're you're i'm guessing you create content then you get more people buying that content so it's like that's that's really your your product right but how do you scale to that degree so people submit their images so they submit yeah. photos, they submit sometimes art illustrations and vectors. We have an average that they submit. So right now we're at like 25. So we're, mm -hmm. we're growing that too. So we're using our existing audience base to increase their average submission rate. And that's done through community and engagement. Uh, and then we have new artists that we're bringing onto the platform and we get sometimes up to 20,000 images a day that, is, that are submitted. So that's the number that we're growing and um, and we built AI to process this content and distribute it faster. So 5 million, again, is kind of like an audacious number, but it's also achievable yeah. if you, in the steps that we've laid out for that. Um, and I, it's just like a golden number. I'd like to get a billion photos on the platform. Mm -hmm. So um, I, I think the largest library might be a Getty at 400 million images, but there's a billion images uploaded every single day on Instagram. So, uh, 
yeah, 1.8 billion. So it's, uh, so yeah, so that's how I think about it. Uh, and again, different formats and mediums. Like this is a photo from Scopio that's been downloaded thousands of times, but then it's been recreated thousands of times. So there's all these different new forms of this art. And I think there's a huge shift happening in, in that idea of what is art, what's sellable. Like you might not just want this, you might actually want the end product of it. So we're working on different, bringing different mixed media. It's really exciting. Um, to have yeah. all of that creativity on your platform, but. That's cool. Thanks. Uh, just a follow yeah, check it out. It's at Scopio, S-C-O-P.io. Yeah. And we're Scopio, Scopio Images on Instagram. Um, sorry, Christine, just a, another follow-up question as well yeah. um, for myself. So how do you kind of uh, monitor like brand safety or like the imagery um so you mentioned some like ai that you have or machine learning around it um mm -hmm. but like offensive imagery these types of things um yeah do you allow them to be used on your platform and still sold and like passed on and distributed um because of you want to have a you know democratic way of distributing or um do you kind of have some you know some criteria around um images that you don't want yeah, we have a not safe for work filter. So we actually, I have actually a very funny story where like I owed Twitter $12,000 for, um, we trained our image set based off of their, one of their emojis is very bad. And uh, yeah. I didn't know that my, my CTO was running that data to basically get these images in so that we could train our model to, to catch these photos. And it was running for months and months and I ended up getting this bill from them. And I looked at the photos that I was paying for and I didn't know what was happening. And I was like, I am so offended by you, Twitter. You need to get your fucking filters right. I'm not paying <laughs> for this. I was like, it was like, I was so early on. It was like half of my, it was probably like, I was spending at that point 15,000, not even a month. So, yeah. um, so I got like so angry and I was like, no, for, I'm not paying you for this. But that we basically trained the system to, um, to uh, yeah, that's the API, but. I do not suggest for entrepreneurs to work with that. But um, but yeah, so we trained the system to identify that. Also, you have to be 18 or older to enter, uh, to submit, or you need your parents' permission. And then we have a lot of like various uses that we'll catch. Like I catched, I caught a video on YouTube. Somebody emailed me the other day and it was why date Vietnam, date women from Vietnam. And they used the photos from Scopio on this YouTube video but it was completely like a, a robot mm -hmm. and it was like really yeah. scary. And it was, it was really scary. So the artists saw their, fo their photo there. And then we, we emailed them like, this is against our terms of use. You cannot use our photos for this. Here's a few other resources, go to these websites and made him like down, remove the video. So those kind of things happen sometimes and you have to police them, but usually you just ask them to take it down. But there's a big responsibility around that of course because people don't want that you know stuff used yeah for that absolutely and jason i had a question for you you said i think during COVID that you had like um boxes in 20 different warehouses does that mean you're using like manufacturers in lots of different places and if so um how do you have quality control over all the products like you're getting that same product made in three different warehouse or in three different manufacturers or are they three separate products that are being made in three different areas for instance yeah yeah good question so we make we we make products um at a partner factory in uh asia and then we make products here in portland uh and then we outsource some of the prescription lenses to labs in california and iowa as far as quality control um we we really only use two labs, one that's internal, again, for most of our product, the other in Asia makes um, products that we saw like, that we're turning a lot of every day. So more of the bulk products, um, yeah. the warehouses themselves are more just for distribution. So we sell into 120 countries and we, we use NetSuite to sort of optimize where we store inventory based on sales trends in different regions. Um, but quality control is all done internally. So we actually have like a quality lab in our building here in Portland. Uh, we have eight people on that team that are, you know, checking uh, daily. They pull lenses off the line. 
because uh, one of our promises to our customers is like you're going to get a premium lens that's better than what came with your eyewear uh, initially. So it's a big focus for us. Yeah. Excellent. Uh, I think we learned a lot today from the from the distinguished panel guys. Thank you so much for for being such a fantastic uh, panel. Uh, you guys did not shy away from sharing what you have or sharing your secret sauce, and you did not shy away from giving away your your uh, uh, experience and your knowledge. So thank you so much. A lot of people today, especially in these times, can use and learn from you and can and can use these learnings and can grow and can fix their businesses. Thank you so much. Uh, really appreciate you giving it away, and uh, I wish you a fabulous week ahead. Thanks, thank you. thank you. Good luck. Thanks for having us. Yeah, nice yeah, good to meet you, you too. Take care. I'll, I'll send an email. I'll connect all of you. All right. Sounds good. Thank Bye -bye. you very much. All right. Take care, guys. Bye-bye. Yep, you too. Bye. -bye.